what are the most significant obstacles you see to getting some kind of health care change enacted, whether it's your organization's plan or someone else's? You've been working in this town for many, many years. You know what the obstacles are. In 2008, 2009, what do you see them as? I think this is a fundamental question that you've posed. And actually, the Kaiser Family Foundation has done years of polling, which I think provides some insights into this question. And, and, and this is, I think, what you, what you learn when you look at the polling, whether it's Kaiser's or others. Essentially, in this country, we have the people who say they are committed to health care reform and getting everybody covered is a very, very high number. That number drops off considerably when people are asked, would you support an individual mandate? Would you support an employer mandate? Would you support higher taxes? Therein is the policy conundrum. So it's important for organizations that support reform to work together to try to help the next president to prepare the way for the nation to understand that we are now being called upon to invest in the country in a way that will improve productivity. Kids shouldn't go, they can't go to school if they don't have health insurance and they're sick. People can't go to work if they don't have health insurance and they're sick. So our entire productivity suffers. So it is a question. It's, an, it's almost a national calling. Is the country ready to contribute to this problem? We hope the answer will be yes. We want to do our contribute part. Contribute to the solution. To the solution, I'm sorry. It, we, we hope that the answer will be yes. But it, I actually meant it in the way, will they be able to contribute to the problem or ameliorating the problem? Right now, if you ask them just pure and simple, would they support reform, it's a very, very high number. But there's a real dissonance between the numbers who support reform and the numbers who are ready and willing and able to actually contribute. And, and that is where we need to do a great deal of work. In the S-CHIP discussion, most recently, last summer, we worked with the American Cancer Society. We worked with a range of advocacy groups to try to generate funding for the S-CHIP uh, expansion. We did a lot of work with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle in support of increasing cigarette taxes. Indeed, states are now turning to increasing cigarette taxes to expand coverage, and all of these are important strategies that states are using. We have to come back to the S-CHIP discussion next spring. We're going to be ready to do that. We'll be an important part of that. But then we have to get the adults on the table, and we have to fund that as a nation. <clears throat> and that is going to be a challenge in terms of what the polls say people are actually willing to do. So we need to be very much working together, not simply on the policy ideas of how do you do it at 30,000 feet from a macro perspective, mm -hmm. but how do you develop the consensus that's going to be necessary for the American people to feel, yes, I want to contribute to this. And yet a lot of the dynamics you just described uh, you could have said four years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago. And I, I, the bottom line question is, is this year, is next year going to be any different? Well, I hope so. Um, and, but the, the, the honest answer to your question is that no one can know in, in large measure. It depends on presidential leadership. It depends on various stakeholder organizations coming together and taking leadership as well. And being willing to compromise on their positions. Well, we've had a history of doing that, and I think a number of other organizations have. Mm -hmm. A number of us worked together on SCHIP. We stayed together throughout the process and worked very hard to try to get it done. I think that that is an early indicator of a number of organizations from a variety of perspectives being willing to tackle this problem productively. But the issue is um, when we talk about social policy in our country, we have, uh, politicians have had a hard time talking to the American people about you have to invest in something that's going to cause you to make sacrifices in terms of committing additional resources. And there, there are several ways to do it. Additional taxes, whether it's general revenues, whether it's consumption taxes, whether it's some other mechanism, but we are going to have to raise additional resources to get this problem solved once and for all. And so it's going to be important for a president to recognize that. I think with that, however, will necessarily come a commitment to not just 
only deal with the access side, but also deal with the value side and the cost side. And I think that could, in fact, make the policy objective clearer, and I think it could make it uh, easier to solve than um, simply putting the cost side on the, on the sidelines. I think when you think about middle-income folks being asked to do something they're not doing today, you need to assure them that they're going to get more value. You need to assure them that folks are very focused on that, and this is what they will see from the perspective of productivity and value in the healthcare system. I have one final question. What are your thoughts about the timing of this? You know, there's a theory that a president would have to move very, very quickly uh, to make some proposals and to work it through the Congress. Because if you take the slow road, things become too bogged down in the traditional politics mm -hmm. of Washington. So what are your thoughts about the necessary timing? Well, everyone's read the, um, the first 100-day books about FDR and right. you know, other presidents. And I think that it is very smart to think about what, as, as a new president, what are the two or three major themes of a presidency, and to begin to educate the public about what's going to be necessary to actually achieve that. And I think that education of the public, whether it happens in 100 days or it takes 200 days, is the most fundamental thing for our being able to get everybody covered, reducing health care costs, and no politician is really talking about reducing health care costs, but if we're going to bring everybody into the system, we have to take on the underlying health care issues, the safety issues, the variation issues. We could talk for another 15 minutes about all those issues, but they matter in terms of leveraging the opportunity to actually achieve reform that will work, will be accepted, and that the American people will commit to funding, and that's the bottom line. So if the education for that takes 200 days rather than 100, I think that that is important to establish that foundation, because the bottom line is we're going to have to raise additional resources, and the American people have to be prepared for that. In campaigns, it's very hard to prepare for folks for that. I think we'll hear a great deal of rhetoric about there's enough money into, in the system, as indeed we've heard over a number of years and decades. I don't happen to believe that's the case. I think you are bringing 50 million people, roughly, now, and we may see that number mm -hmm. in the summer when we see the new census number, into the system that don't have coverage, and that we're going to have to fund. But at the same time, the American people are going to expect a conversation about improving value, improving efficiency. We have comparative effectiveness, which may happen this year. We don't have an ability to assess technology, drug to drug, drug to device, et cetera. All that's going to be very, very important. Karen Ignani, thank you so thank much. You. The Kaiser Family Foundation presents HealthOH.org, election news, analysis, and events.